When you think of the clean energy transition, you might think of solar panels on grassy fields, windmills spinning under clouds and bright sky, or electric trains gliding through idyllic pastures. What people forget about is the destruction. Millions of tons of metal must be ripped out of the earth, destroying ecosystems and sometimes doing permanent environmental damage. It makes you wonder, why are we destroying the planet in order to save the planet? To end the climate crisis, we need to mine a lot of metal. Minerals. We need lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and graphite for batteries, rare earth elements for magnets that make turbines and motors work, and lots and lots of copper and aluminum for transmission networks. Many have argued that the clean energy transition will take too many resources, perhaps as an argument for why we should keep on burning fossil fuels. While overall I disagree, and will explain why in this video, they raise some good points. For instance, the typical electric car requires six times the minerals of a typical combustion engine vehicle. If we want zero emissions vehicles, we need to mine those minerals that we turn into their batteries. Renewables also have a large mineral cost. Lately we've been using way more of these metals to power the grid. Since 2010, we've been using 50% more minerals per unit of new capacity. Experts estimate that if we were to reach the goals laid out in the Paris Agreement, we'll need to quadruple our mineral production by 2040. It's a tall order, and if it's not done right, all these new mines could have some messy consequences. So you might wonder, is clean energy really worth it if it means so much mining? If you've ever looked at a picture of a mine, you probably notice immediately it's ugly. In fact, photos of mines are often used to highlight how humans are devastating the planet. It's ironic that this seemingly destructive practice is the key to a clean energy solution. Even in climate activism, folks commonly use photos of coal mines to show how badly we're hurting the planet. And the damage goes deeper than just looks. Mining produces lots of dust, and this dust is spread to nearby communities by the wind. While a little dust usually doesn't hurt, mining ends up making rare and dangerous dust that can include lead, arsenic, cadmium, and other toxic metals. This causes health problems for nearby communities. These minerals also seep into the water. This means nearby water, even groundwater, can become toxic. Or mining could make nearby water more acidic, creating a sudden change that harms the wildlife that depends on that water. And obviously, mining involves clearing land before digging into it. Any plants that were on that land are killed, and animals have to move elsewhere. For a big mine, that can really disrupt the ecosystem. But it's not just animals that are worried about losing their homes to mining. Indigenous peoples and local communities often oppose nearby mines. In one example in the US, the Thacker Pass mining project is slated to be the largest lithium mine in the whole country. This would give the US a key resource it needs to decarbonize, but unfortunately, the mine is near an indigenous community that opposes it. You see, in 1865, U.S. cavalry massacred dozens of indigenous Paiute families on Thacker Pass. To understand why this site is sacred, let's listen to an audio clip from a Paiute descendant that describes this atrocity. What happened was the Paiute people that was up there, a whole family was killed up there while the men went over the mountains to go hunt. The hunters came back maybe a day or so later, and they seen their family that next morning. You know, they they seen their family murdered. You know, killed women and children and everybody elders. What happened was that they split them open, and you know, pulled their pulled it open like how you would when you're undressing a deer. And they had them wrapped up all over the sagebrush. So that's why they called it Bilimana, translated into English, it's called Rotten Moon, because of, you know, the destruction of that village that was there. Since then, Thacker Pass has been a sacred site, an area the community does not want to see turned into a lithium mine. Ranchers and others in the community also oppose the project. No one wants to see their backyard turned into a big, ugly pit, let alone deal with the potential ecosystem and health concerns that mining can cause. But these problems in America seem small compared to what we see elsewhere in the world. The Democratic Republic of Congo holds the majority of the world's discovered cobalt reserves. And since all sorts of tech ranging from smartphones to electric cars needs cobalt, mining is a big industry there. But the industry relies on horrific work conditions. Miners are forced to do backbreaking work, inhaling toxic cobalt dust and tearing down rainforests for just a few dollars a day. The work has often been compared to slavery, as many locals have few options besides toughing it out in the mines. There's even reports of militias abducting or recruiting children to mine. It's a dark example of how our global economy, and even a goal as beautiful as clean energy, can cause cause horrors far out of sight of the end consumers. The atrocity makes it clear how important it is to enforce labor laws in every country 
producing these resources. Besides the local effects mining has on people and ecosystems, it also affects the global balance of power. Lithium is the non-renewable resource that makes renewable energy possible. In a sense, it's like the next oil. There's only so much of it accessible for mining, and every country will need it to power their grid and electric vehicles. And just like oil caused decades of international conflict as countries scrambled to control oil fields, some say lithium and other minerals could cause global conflicts and upsets to power structures. China is particularly well positioned, as it currently produces over 60% of the world's rare earth elements that are key for windmills. They also refine the majority of lithium and cobalt, even if it's not mined within their borders. And while oil fields are very widely distributed around the world, minerals are sometimes extremely concentrated in a few countries. Mineable lithium is mostly in the Andes Mountains, for instance. For lithium, cobalt, and rare earth elements, just the top three countries produce well over three quarters of the global output. So the mining we need to end the climate crisis can cause not just damage to ecosystems, wildlife, and human health, but also human rights violations and potentially even an upset in the global balance of power. Somehow, it gets worse. Critics also love mentioning one more downside of mining, the energy requirements. Research suggests that the energy consumption for digging up the necessary materials for clean energy could eat up somewhere between 1 and 10 percent of Earth's carbon budget. But of course, if we don't build clean energy, we'll blow way past our carbon budget no matter what. Earth would just keep getting hotter, causing endlessly increasing hurricanes, heat waves, and floods as it gradually and then suddenly causes ecosystems to collapse and harvests to fail. And actually, we wouldn't just emit more CO2 if we stuck with fossil fuels. We would have to mine more than if we decarbonize. When we hear about all the damage that mining for clean energy causes, it's easy to forget that fossil fuels are causing far more damage today, partly because of climate change and pollution but also because of how much mining they require. In fact, we currently extract way more fossil fuels from the earth than any other mineral. Coal is the biggest source of revenue for mining companies. And even if we project for all the increase in mining clean energy will require, as a whole, clean energy will require less mining than continuing to extract and use fossil fuels. One look at the tar sands in Canada paints a clear picture. The region, which has oil oozing in its sand, has turned into a dystopian moonscape of oil extraction. The mine itself is the size size of New York City. What was once pristine boreal forest and wetlands has been gutted for oil extraction. The fumes from the mine sting the eyes of locals who have opposed the project since the beginning, but were ignored in the pursuit of profit. If we continue using fossil fuels, we'll see only more of this. With clean energy, we'd be able to avoid some of this destructive mining. So if we've established that clean energy is truly cleaner, then the question becomes, is it possible? Critics have claimed there simply isn't enough key materials to follow through with decarbonization that will quickly run out of key supplies. On first glance, this argument seems true. One study rightfully found that reserves of eight metals like cobalt, gold, silver, and zinc would run out before we can fully decarbonize. But the trick in studies like this is the difference between what counts as reserves and what counts as resources. In mining terms, reserves means minerals that are easy enough and profitable to extract, whereas resources are minerals that don't make economic sense to extract yet or we don't have the technology to extract them yet. And as the same study notes, our technology is always changing. In the words of the study, reserves are subject to techno-economic changes, meaning as new mining tech is invented or as economic constraints change, we could see way more of this resource mined than what we are currently counting as reserves today. It's also important to note that more mineral resources are discovered all the time. While you might think that reserves and resources are some fixed amount that just goes down as we use it, we often discover more reserves faster than we use them up. For instance, since 2010, global lithium reserves have doubled thanks to new discoveries. Graphite, nickel, and cobalt reserves have also increased significantly in the past decade, with graphite reserves increasing by nearly a factor of five since 2010. In other words, if we want it, we might find it. One futuristic and controversial new mining method could be deep sea mining. Although the issue needs to be studied more so we can fully understand the consequences, some types of deep sea mining might actually be less destructive than above ground mining. Deep in the ocean, on the abyssal plains of the Pacific, there are blobs of metal and earth called polymetallic nodules. These small blobs of metal, typically small enough to fit in your palm, contain high concentrations of valuable minerals, including copper, cobalt, manganese, and more. If we could carefully, safely extract these nodules from the seabed, 
and we fully understood what ecosystem consequences it would have, these could be a massive source of metal. Research suggests that there's more cobalt, manganese, and nickel in these nodules than in all of our current reserves on land. And even if we were to somehow run out of a key mineral, it's not like we'd be out of options. Usually we can use a substitute instead. For instance, companies and researchers are currently working on sodium ion batteries that would function similarly to the popular lithium ion batteries used in electric cars. Sodium ion batteries would be slightly less energy dense than lithium batteries, but they could be much cheaper and help relieve pressure if we run into any supply chain issues with lithium down the road. And if that's not enough, we will also be able to recycle most of these metals. With fossil fuels, we pump fuel out of the ground and burn it, permanently destroying the compounds we spent so much time and money pulling from the earth. But with all these clean energy minerals, we can recycle them once the technology is out of date or they get damaged. Eventually, recycling could provide all the minerals we need as we reach a circular economy. While we're discovering new sources of minerals and building new technology to substitute and recycle these minerals, we can also reduce our material requirements by simply being efficient. Mass transit, e-bikes, and walkable cities can drastically reduce how many cars we need to make. Saving energy through efficient and smart appliances will reduce the amount of energy we need. Building better power transmission lines can also ensure we make the most out of our renewables and don't ever overbuild them. All of these solutions reduce the amount of minerals we ultimately need to extract. So as you can see, it won't be easy to decarbonize, but it is possible and we must do it to keep our planet living for future generations. We have the resources to make it happen, and as I've discussed in previous videos, it can even be profitable. We need some more policies and safeguards to make mining less destructive, but given how far we've already come with the clean energy transition, putting in the work to make it safe and just for everyone seems completely doable. Honestly, in my opinion, it's not just the clean energy transition that's fixable. It's the whole climate crisis. If you're wondering what you can do to help end the climate crisis, you should check out the company I co-founded called Rent. It's a website where you can calculate your carbon footprint, receive personalized recommendations on ways you can help, and even directly fund key climate solutions like rainforest protection and refrigerant destruction. We're on a mission to do everything we can to help decarbonize as fast as possible, and we'd love to have you join us. Thank you.